You fool! Warren is dead. The Halloween Experiment by Ian Gordon Overseer's Lock, October 26th, 1976. Dr. Stefan Helm speaking. I will refrain from providing a detailed analysis of yesterday's events for the time being. Must press on. Project Delusion continues with Participant B, the placid Miss Hennessy. Hennessy is haunted by a Spectre of sorts, a being best described by the lady herself. She has been placed in the blue room, the color again being a trigger. My initial inclination was to place her in the black room. However, such an environment would only serve to hinder the participant's ability to relate her account. The telling of her story is, as it is in all cases, necessary in terms of drawing a line between delusion and reality. So if the results of experiment A are anything to go by, my process may yet require modification. Lights on. Miss Hennessy, can you hear me? Yes, Doctor, clearly. Describe for me, if you will, your surroundings. Carmen, sky blue. I close my eyes. I can almost hear the ocean. Interesting. Uh, Calm enough to tell your story? I believe so, Doctor. In your own time. I'm a photographer by trade. Clients range from would-be models to small business owners. I did some high-profile corporate stuff in the late 60s, but I much prefer to keep ventures relatively low-key these days. The whole thing began with a particular photo shoot in the centre of town, a shoot involving the owner and staff of the Ramplin Aquarium on Market Street. I took a good dozen or so snaps of the girls, then moved on to Janet Ramplin herself. I didn't notice anything especially unusual at the time, but I do remember feeling that something was off about that last photograph I took of Janet. Anyway, cut to several days later, and I'm sitting in my dark room developing film. I'd captured a couple of decent photos of the girls and one excellent photo of Janet, but it was in the development of this final image that I noticed the oddity I'd been only partially aware of at the time. Behind Janet, just inside the store, were situated a number of items arranged in such a way as to suggest, vaguely, an upright figure a figure that appeared to be peeping at me. After a thorough examination of the picture, I managed to identify its various components. The left leg and foot of the thing belonged to a light blue umbrella. The torso above was nothing more than a navy backpack suspended from the inner wall. A limp and insubstantial arm was a sad-looking scarf, and the head was a pumpkin-shaped fishbowl positioned on the shop counter. I know it's difficult to get an idea of the thing from such a description, but these were the basic elements, casually assembled to form the appearance of a tall man in a blue suit with a fishbowl for a head. Even the fish in the bowl, two common goldfish, gave the impression of a pair of golden eyes staring back at me. I might go as far as to say that there was an expression on that watery face. One of disapproval, almost as though I'd uncovered a living secret that wished to remain hidden. I'm sorry to say that the photograph no longer exists, but taking what followed into account, I hope you'll appreciate why I took the decision to destroy it, and the others. Please continue. The image of the fishbowl man haunted me through the rest of the day and late into the night. So, the following morning, 
I returned to the Ramplin Aquarium and, without knowing exactly why, I bought the two goldfish and a square tank to take them home in. I figured, on some level or other, that buying the fish would nullify the power of the weird photograph, that I was, in effect, dismantling the figure, unmaking it, undoing its ability to play on my mind. I'm sure Janet thought I was acting a little strange. Perhaps it had something to do with the fact that I kept glaring at the blue umbrella by the door and that sad-looking scarf. The first thing I did when I got home was place the fish tank on my dining table in the living room. I fed the little blighters and snuck off to the dark room to catch up on some work. I hadn't so much as glanced at that creepy photo of Janet Ramplin since buying the goldfish. I was afraid to look, to tell you the truth. I could still see that strange fishball man in the back of my mind, and that was where I wanted him to stay for the time being. But for some reason or other, on my way out of the dark room, I grabbed the photograph and took it with me into the living room. With a glass of sherry in one hand, I flipped the photograph over, and lo and behold, there he was, the odd fellow in the blue suit. But here's where things start to get really weird. Although Fishball Man was still standing there, all erect and sinister, his golden eyes were missing. The fish, Doctor, they were no longer in the photograph. I downed the sherry and immediately poured myself another one. I looked again. But those eyes, those fish eyes, were nowhere to be seen. What was happening? Had I accidentally uncovered a hidden world with my camera? A world in which everyday items take on weird and wonderful life when our backs are turned, when our attention is elsewhere? I put my manic thoughts down to the sherry and sat there in a stony silence watching the goldfish swimming absently back and forth in the square tank. Slowly but surely, like the intrusion of a slender thorn in my mind, I became overwhelmed by the desire to collect my instant camera and to shoot blindly through the living room window. My apartment's on the second floor of an old mill, with a dreary view of the world outside, but still, I felt the compulsion, so I grabbed the camera in question and rushed to the window, snapping away rapidly, targeting the colourless trees in the garden below, the ugly shrubs, the broken fence bordering the derelict tennis courts, the countless identical windows belonging to the building opposite, the shadowy alley in between. Afterwards, I sat at the kitchen table and studied the fresh photographs was something speaking to me, trying to communicate with me through the medium of film. The nine images were grainy and in the main out of focus, but in three of them, I appeared to have captured the outline of something disturbingly familiar. A tall, thin figure with a large bowl for a head. At first, it was in the tennis court silhouetted by the light from a neighbouring street lamp in the alley. Then, in the second shot, it was among the trees in the communal gardens, the directional light from the street lamp reflected from the glass of the bowl. And lastly, in the third photo, it was directly below my window, in the process of extending its arms, but extending them towards what? A window? A door? Or could it... <sighs> it's okay, Miss Hennessy. You're in a safe place. Please, continue. <sighs> I heard a ghastly sloshing. The sound of a small bowl of water splashing back and forth just below my window. My open window. I heard lots of strange scratching as if something was climbing up the wall towards my apartment. And then I saw it. My eyes were glued to it. Other than the fishbowl, it wasn't at all how it had appeared in the photograph. 
The creature came ambling through my window, forcing it all the way open in the process. Its body a navy lump of clay with an outer layer of skin like flaky paint. Its arms and legs little more than clumsy, worm-like strands. It flopped onto the living room floor, sloshing water onto the lino as it did so. I was frozen in place. My jaw was next to my knees. I trembled in its presence. I urinated. Once again, feeling that something was amiss, I saw that, just as the case had been in the photograph of Janet Ramplin, the goldfish were missing from the figure's fishbowl head. It crossed the living room in my direction, closing in on the dining table. That sloshing sound, I'll never forget it. That terrible splashing, and the noise its weird legs made coming into contact with the linoleum floor. The sound of metal-tipped canes tapped on wood. And then, somehow, I sensed its objective. It was moving towards the fish tank. It's here for the fish, I mumbled over and over again. Its eyes, it's here for the fish. But then, a further thought occurred. Perhaps it would come for me after collecting its eyes. Maybe it needed those eyes in order to capture me. I had exposed it, quite literally, and I still felt that bizarre sense of disapproval in its presence. It wanted to remain hidden. And that, Doctor, is why I jumped out of the window. I couldn't bear it. I had absolutely no desire to wait for it to come after me. I landed on the grass in front of Mrs. Cockrell's kitchen window. Fortunately, she was washing the dishes at the time. I broke both of my ankles. It was the topsoil that saved me, I'm told, but I don't remember too much about that. The fall knocked me clean out. Thank God for small mercies, eh? If that fishbowl fella was coming for me, I sure as hell didn't want to know about it. But as of yet, he hasn't come for me. That's why I destroyed the photographs to make amends. He's no reason to come after me if I've burned all the evidence of his existence, right? Pity no one believes me. No matter though, I got my vindication after leaving the hospital. An odd stain by the window where my blue friend spilled some of his mind, and a few flakes of navy paint spread about the place by pointed feet. So, what do you think, Doctor? Am I completely mad? I wouldn't use that term, Miss Hennessy. It hardly matters. You know how it is for me now. If I see even a hint of blue, partially obscured in a room or in, in a crowd, I swear it's the fishbowl man. He's got his eyes back now. He can see again. What if he's still after me? It's okay in here, though. Everything's blue. Brightly lit. He prefers not to reveal himself entirely. Sticks to the shadows. Peeps around corners. And the fish you bought? What happened to them? They disappeared, of course. Belonged to his head, remember? Doubtful. The fishbowl man is a figment of your imagination. Can't you see that? I don't believe it for a second. Not for a sec. What in the name? Ah. Participant B, Miss Lila Hennessy. Deceased. Drowned, in fact. Somehow she drowned in her cell. I can't believe this. More tomorrow. Thanks for listening today. Join us again tomorrow for part three of the Halloween experiment. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, Click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. 
If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the Join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.